I'm Edward October, and this is A Nefarious Nightmare. This podcast contains foul language and discussions of violence. Additional trigger warnings will be posted as needed in the show notes. Listener discretion is advised. On today's episode, we want to ask a question. Do you think Stacey Lannert should answer for her crimes? She took justice into her own hands. And all we can say to that is that some people feel like they have no choice but to. Obviously, Amanda and I have our own theories and opinions. And based off of our content and advocacy, I'm sure you can deduce what they are. But we would much prefer for you to decide without our input. This case is heartbreaking, no matter how you look at it. With that... I'm Courtney Fenner. And I'm Amanda Cronin. And a nefarious nightmare presents, in her own hands, the case of Stacey Lannert. Every so often, you will listen to a true crime podcast cover a case where a victim or survivor will take justice into their own hands. For example, to name a few, Omaima Nelson, Jason Vukovic, Marianne Bachmeyer, who, by the way, shot her daughter's murderer in the middle of his trial. The case we discuss today isn't an exception. These cases can be touchy and confusing, because who's the good guy here? Everyone will argue either for the vigilante or against, so instead of inserting our own opinion, we're going to leave this one up for you all to debate. So let's dive in. Stacey Lannert was born in 1972 to parents Tom and Deborah. Tom and Deborah met when Deborah was 18 and still living with her parents. They dated for three months before getting married. Tom was the son of Ken and Mae Lannert and he did not have a great relationship with his parents growing up and into adulthood. Deborah was one of eight kids and had a very traumatic childhood, including being sexually assaulted by her own father starting at age 11. Stacy had a sister, Christy, who was two years younger than she was. They were a typical middle-class family living in St. Louis, Missouri. Later on, neighbors described the family as quiet and didn't mingle with the neighbors. When Stacy was in third grade, her father began sexually abusing her, and after about a year, molestation escalated to sexual assault. Later on in life, when someone asks if he ever abused her while he was sober, she would state, quote, never. People say, how could you love this monster? But he wasn't always a monster. There would be periods when he would lay off the drinking, especially when he was more concerned about me. I'd get a glimpse of who he could be, and then it was gone. So you have that endless cycle of trying to get that person back, fighting for them when they don't even want to fight for themselves, until you just eventually give up the fight, end quote. The abuse only happened when he was drunk and when Deborah wouldn't allow him to sleep with her. Tom swore Stacy to secrecy and made her believe that this was something that, quote, favorite daughters did with their dads, end quote. It wasn't until she was in the eighth grade that she realized that it was wrong and just not normal. She began trying to avoid him, but that just made him angrier and more violent with her. He also started to want to perform oral sex on her and not stopping until she climaxed. And before we continue... We do want to state that it is a fact that involuntary climax does occur in a sexual assault case and that it does not mean that the victim actually enjoyed it. So if you are a sexual assault victim and you happen to be listening to this, please know that sometimes that's involuntary and it is absolutely not your fault. With that being said, not surprisingly, these actions made Stacey feel guilty, shameful, and confused causing her to escape into a quote-unquote safe place that she had created in her mind. The sexual abuse was not a secret like Tom and Stacy thought it was, sadly. Her mother, cousin, babysitter, and a psychologist suspected that she was being abused. 
her mother discovered a pair of bloody underwear of Stacy's hidden in the basement stairs that was by the TV room where Stacy was usually abused. Deborah would even hear Stacy's cries from the basement, but just ignore them and figure Tom would take care of whatever she was crying about. We don't want to speculate that her mom knew, but at this point, if she did know, it's pretty messed up that she knew something had occurred and didn't try to step in and protect her daughter. It's unfortunate that in many cases, a parent will just know, like a gut feeling, but hold back from saying or doing anything out of fear or because they want to protect their family. Whatever the cause, whatever the case, it's good that we all are being more mindful of not being ignorant to what happens to our children. Deborah later said in an interview that she was unaware of what was happening to her daughters before and after their divorce. Quote, What I felt was that he loved them and that he wouldn't hurt them. I thought he loved his daughters. I feel like I failed to protect my children and I will never forget that. I will never live this down no matter what. End quote. Stacy, your mom Mm-hmm. never tried to intercede during all this time. Isn't it true that she found your bloody underwear stashed in various places around the home and you were just a little girl? I was, I was, but we all made mistakes in our past and you know she did ask me about them and I didn't tell her what they were from. I, you know, there's a lot of mistakes in the past and I hope to leave them there. In her book, Redemption, Stacy states that she thought of her father as two different people. She said that she knew daddy, and he was nice and had really beautiful blue eyes. But then she knew Tom, and he would physically change. She says that his blue eyes would get lighter, like they were becoming cold and icy. She said that her father would sit me on his lap for hours and tell me, quote, never let a guy treat you badly, end quote. Another factor to know in this case is Stacy unfortunately developed a pelvic inflammatory disease caused by frequent sexual assaults, and this caused her to be sterile to where she couldn't bear children of her own. She has stated in the past that when she was 17, that was the most devastating news to her, but in an interview she stated that, quote, I've had a lot of time to come to peace with it. I do my best I can in my niece's life. End quote. So Tom and Deborah ended up getting divorced when Stacy was 12 and Deborah then left town, then found a new husband and moved away without her two daughters. This caused Tom to start drinking way more and the abuse escalated to multiple times a week. When Stacy was a senior in high school, she dropped out and moved to Guam where her mother and stepfather lived, even though she says that she was not welcome there. Christy was left behind alone with Tom And she soon dropped out of school as well and bounced between living with Tom, Deborah, and different relatives. In the past, Christy had been physically abused but never sexually abused. Christy started to call Stacy, begging her to come home, and Stacy said that she could hear the change in her voice and she started to sound more and more desperate each time. During one of these conversations while begging Stacy to come home, she admitted to Stacy that Tom had began to sexually assault her. Stacy felt horrible and guilty, so she moved back home to Missouri. He didn't actually rape me until I was nine. That's the first time it happened. Um, Before that, when I was eight, it was grooming. It was him and I sharing a special time. I didn't know that what we were doing was wrong or that I was committing a sexual act with my father. And when you were nine, about a year after this abuse started, he escalated the abuse into into full-blown rape yes and this went on for how long to the age of 18 and how often was this system happening it varied and I lived back and forth in between my parents so there would be breaks from him and my father was an alcoholic and he would try to quit drinking and during those attempts our life was our life was more peaceful less violent So it wasn't every day. Sometimes it could be five times a week. Sometimes I'd go a couple months without any what I call incidents occurring. Where was your mother in all this? They divorced when I was 12 years old. 
and I went to live with him. When I read the book, I just couldn't envisage any situation worse for you than at the age of 12, after four years of abuse and then rape, your parents split up and you're left with this monster. It's because I didn't know the words to tell someone what was happening to me. When I was 12, I, ba I had told a babysitter, and the babysitter told my mother that my father hurt me. And because the words were so diluted, she didn't understand the true scope of what was going on. So when she didn't step in and protect me immediately, I became extremely resentful and angry towards her. As soon as Stacy arrived home to Missouri, Tom immediately began assaulting her again. Stacy said it was during this time that the evil thoughts started forming in her head. She started fantasizing about him being dead and gone, and over time she began obsessing over these thoughts. It was, in her mind, the only way she could have a happy future for not only herself, but for Christy as well. In her state of mind, she saw no other options. She told a friend of hers, Ron Barnett, that she wanted to either kill him herself or have someone kill her. And he told her what to do with his car so that it would explode when he was driving. This plan obviously didn't work, so he then advised her on how to shoot her father in such a way that the police would think a burglar had done it. Around this time, Stacy started to use her father's credit cards and cashing checks on his bank account. She would ask her male friends to act like her father on the phone when cashing checks at the check cashing businesses, since they always needed to call to verify her authority to cash the checks. With the money, she bought a car stereo, bought friends gifts, dinners, paid Ron's rent, and paid for the hotel her and Christy stayed at the night of the murder. Several days before the murder, Stacy told a friend, Jason Fortune, that her father owned a certificate of deposit worth at least $100,000, and she stated that if he were to die, she would get that money. This, of course, was later brought up in her trial, and Jason did testify that Stacy had told him all of the things that she would buy with that money. After his death, Tom's estate was actually valued at $482,000, including a $100,000 certificate of deposit, a little under $50,000 in a savings account, and a life insurance policy with death benefits of $180,000. On July 4th, 1990, Stacy saw Tom drag Christy to his bedroom to sexually assault her while she begged and screamed for him to stop. Later, the sisters ran out, spent some time at a fair, and then decided to get a hotel room later that night. Since they would not be going back to their father's house, they had both decided that they were going to leave for good. But at around 4.15 a.m., they went back to Tom's house because they left the puppy at home with him, and they feared that he would kill the dog, since he had threatened it many times. Stacy entered the house through the basement window in order to not wake her father. And when she saw the rifle she learned to shoot with laying there, she passed by it and made her way upstairs to get the dog and their belongings. Christy was with her at this time as well. Let's go to the moment that you pulled the trigger and killed your father. Did you intend to kill him then? No. I had no intention of taking his life. I wanted him to know that when I said, we're leaving and this is going to stop, that I meant it. And I wanted to be a threat, but I didn't mean to harm him. You go back to the house. He is semi-conscious on the couch. He's been drinking, as he usually was. What happens then? The gun was downstairs, and I think I just went back to that moment where I saw him dragging my sister into his bedroom. And I just stepped over a line that no one should have to step over. And you shot him? And I shot him. The, the first shot doesn't kill him. He does what? How does he react? He didn't realize that he had been shot. And he woke up screaming my name, sat up sitting my name, saying my name. And so, you know, I was terrified. 
and immediately remorseful for what had happened. And I went and turned on the porch light and opened the door and was going to find a phone to call an ambulance. And then he just started calling me and Christy all kinds of names and blamed us for not for the ambulance taking too long to come. Earlier during the altercation that had happened, he took all the phones and ripped them out of the wall and had hit them. So when I went to go find a phone to save his life, I couldn't find it. And he started calling me all kinds of horrors and bitches and told me to just wait until he got up from that couch. And I knew, I knew that if he ever got up, that we would die. So what did you do? I shot him the second time. In the, in the head this time? I didn't know where it was. I had placed the gun on a ledge behind him and just closed my eyes and pulled the trigger. And I just figured whatever happened would happen. She then left the house the same way she entered, bringing the rifle with her. She didn't report anything, and the next day, she gave the rifle to a friend to get rid of. Then, she and another friend went to her father's house with a plan to make it seem like she just walked in and found him that way, you know, dead. After cleaning her whole car, she called the police. During her friend's questioning, she implicated Stacy, and it didn't take long before Stacy confessed to killing her father. The officer on scene was Lieutenant Tom Schultz. He states that, quote, The last thing I told that young lady when I left her, and it was late that night, I told her, I'll be there for you, end quote. But just like other shady shit in this case, the prosecutors never called him to testify, even though Schultz had spent years investigating child sex crimes, and he was the first person to question Stacy that day. He states that, quote, I didn't fit in with the focus of the prosecution at the time, and the prosecutor was hungry for the first-degree murder conviction, end quote. Stacy later said that she felt very betrayed because Schultz hadn't testified, and it wasn't until after she was released that she found out he would have testified on her behalf had he been called to the witness stand. He even purposely didn't contact her while in prison because he didn't want his affidavit to be colored by anything other than his observations on the night that he had questioned her. Stacy also spoke about Schultz saying, quote, I haven't seen or spoken to him this entire time, but I feel a connection with him that I'll probably never feel with another human being because he was the first person who helped me, who believed me. It took a long time for it to come to fruition, but he did stand behind me and he helped. And I'm just very thankful. Stacy was charged with murder in the first degree and other felonies related to the murder. Stacy argued at trial that she was not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. She also attempted to use battered spouse syndrome as evidence, but in a pre-trial ruling, the trial court excluded anyone from mentioning in trial that Stacy had suffered from battered spouse syndrome until such time as self-defense is injected into the case. But they did allow Stacy to, quote, make an offer of proof showing evidence injecting self-defense in order to mention battered spouse syndrome in her opening statement and trial, end quote. The trial court did allow her to present evidence of her abuse. At the close of the evidence, the trial court refused to instruct the jury on self-defense. According to the court, quote, the defendant's testimony didn't indicate that she was in immediate fear of serious physical injury or death as her testimony was that her father was asleep and passed out and drunk, or at least asleep. And she knew that when she fired the first shot. Now, you've never made any bones about it. You shot your father. He was unarmed. Did the jury ever know about your allegations of sex abuse starting at age eight? They were allowed to know, but not take it into account. So... Right. So actually, I was very fortunate. Four members of the jury wrote affidavits to um, the governor's office for my release. So, Stacy, how old are you? The jury found Stacy guilty of murder in the first degree and armed criminal action. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. 
Soon after she did appeal the conviction and sentence, as well as the denial of her motion for post-conviction relief. During the appeal, Stacy claimed that the trial court made a big mistake overruling her motion to present the battered spouse syndrome evidence and refusing to instruct the jury on self-defense. The Missouri Court of Appeals concluded that, quote, the issue was not preserved for appeal. Since it presented no evidence of self-defense, nor did she have proof, and the court also rejected her second claim. After all this failed, Stacy filed a petition for a writ of habeas corpus pursuant, which is something used by a state prisoner to challenge the validity of a state criminal conviction or sentence for the purpose of obtaining release for custody. The district court denied the motion in its entirety, but issued a certificate of appealability on her claim that the trial court violated her 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendment rights to due process and a fair trial by excluding evidence of Bowdard spouse syndrome and in refusing to instruct the jury on self-defense. Also to mention is that after sentencing, some members of the jury expressed complete outrage that they weren't given the facts of sexual and physical abuse they were never shown in the trial. Soon after the presiding judge, the Honorable Stephen H. Goldman, issued a statement about the case, quote, The sentence is severe for a 20-year-old. It is also somewhat surprising considering the evidence of sexual abuse by the victim's father. A conventional life sentence would be more appropriate from a comparison standpoint, end quote. The Missouri Court of Appeals soon found in favor of the trial judge. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit issued this following statement after Stacy filed her petition for appeal. Quote, the absence of aggression or provocation for the part of the defender element of the Missouri self-defense statute does not articulate a time frame during which the initial act of aggression and the act of self-defense must occur. It is therefore deeply troubling that the jury was not completely informed of the scope of the abuse that Lannert suffered. Her fear or her rage that her sister may have also been victimized by their father. This evidence of battered spouse syndrome might have placed Lannert's action in proper context and may have allowed a jury to conclude that Lannert was not the initial aggressor on the night of her father's death, potentially resulting in a very different outcome than what she faces today. End quote. On March 11th, 2003, the court also found in favor of the original trial judge. The ruling held that the appeal failed, quote, deadly force may be used in self-defense only when there is an absence of aggression or provocation on the part of the defender, a real or apparently real necessity for the defender to kill in order to save himself from an immediate danger of serious bodily injury or death, a reasonable cause for the defender's belief in such necessity, or an attempt by the defender to do all within his power consistent with his personal safety to avoid the danger and the need to take a life." End quote. First, the court rejected Stacy's position that, quote, a man who raped his daughter when she was in third grade made him the initial aggressor and the author of his own doom, end quote. Then, the court noted that the battered spouse syndrome does not amount to a defense just in itself, but that it is just a support for a claim of self-defense. The court declined to override Missouri's rules for jury instruction or interpretation of the battered spouse syndrome law. After exhausting all of her appeals, she sought out Governor Matt Blunt for either commutation of her sentence to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 15 years or pardon. And on January 10th, 2009, the outgoing governor announced the commutation. Stacy was described as a model prisoner, active in many community projects as well as helping other survivors of incest and abuse. She trained service dogs for the handicapped in an organization called CHAMPS, and she was also the president of the outreach program that brought troubled teens to prison for a wake-up call. Later in an interview, Stacy was asked what she thought when she found out she was being let out of prison, and she said, quote, it happened so quickly that I didn't have time to wrap my mind around it. All we were asking for was that the without parole be lifted. 
I would have served years before parole. Never in my wildest imagination did I dare dream for the outcome that happened. My life was changed on July 4th, 1990 in the blink of an eye. And it was changed again on January 10th, 2009. Not everyone was happy about Stacy getting out though. St. Louis County Prosecutor Bob McCulloch thinks that she is a manipulative liar who deserves to live out the rest of her life in prison. Quote, I have not changed my mind at all about Stacy Lannert. She murdered her father for his inheritance and solely for his inheritance. She was never sexually abused by her father or anyone else. She ought to be back in the penitentiary and shame on Governor Blunt for letting her out. End quote. Now, Stacy did respond to this saying that money had absolutely nothing to do with it. She killed him solely to stop him from abusing her and Christy. Quote, I wanted him to leave me alone. I wanted him to leave her alone. I didn't really necessarily want him to die, but I didn't want him to be able to hurt us again, to be able to get us. End quote. Also, I do want to mention Christy because she was a victim as well. She was convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and was sentenced to five years in prison. She was released after serving two and a half years. To give everyone Christy's point of view, she said that she was in first grade when her father started beating her and that she was 12 when he started making her drink alcohol with him. The more he drank, the more violent he would become, she says. Even to this day, she cannot look at the home that they grew up in. Quote, I don't care to see the stairs that he used to kick me down. I don't. I don't want to see the windows that I would have to climb out at night so I didn't have to wake up being choked. End quote. Christy said in one interview. Christy also has said that she told Stacy to, quote, just do it. End quote. Today, Stacy runs an organization called Healing Sisters which is a resource website and a nonprofit agency to end sexual abuse in America. And when she is questioned about how she feels about the justice system, she replies with quote, the justice system really did to me prevail in the end. Others might not agree, but to me it did end quote. Anyone who sees Stacy speak would be amazed by how she manages to speak from a factual perspective telling her audience about the awful things that happened to her in a way that is not meant to bring her sympathy, but to bring awareness to what she calls an epidemic of domestic violence. She also tells her audience about several programs that work for victim rights, as well as prevention of all forms of domestic violence. She encourages everyone to go check out RAIN, which is for Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. Also check out Darkness to Light and Take Back the Night programs. When asked if she regretted her decision to kill her father, she replied, quote, I regret the actions that led me there, but I really like who I have become. Of course, I wish it was less time, but shame is extremely powerful in my life. And whether people believe I was abused or wasn't abused, I was incarcerated for 18 years. I rendered unto Caesar. Truly, it should satisfy the harshest cynic. Having that behind me, it moves me forward where otherwise I might stop because of shame. End quote. God, I really honestly believed that I would spend the rest of my life in prison. And then six days later, I walked out. I would have been okay was spending my life in prison because it was the life I had and the choices that I would have made would have given me hope each day, given me a freedom within each second. But I'm certainly thankful <laughs> that I received clemency and was able to experience all this, all this. So it's like the universe just came together for me and you know thank God thank God that I have the opportunity I hope that I can make a difference in others and say you know there is there is life there is freedom there is forgiveness there is choice and even there we have to choose to move forward to put our past in the past and I'm opening I'm starting a nonprofit because I want to help others heal. I want to help others find their voice. 
I want everything that what I went through and what I survived to make a difference. Not just in my life, but in others. Otherwise, what was it for? So what do you all think? Feel free to send us an email or leave a comment under our show notes for this episode in the Instagram. Don't forget to rate and review us on Apple. Just um, (laughs) please don't rate us based on season one. Those damn crickets will just forever haunt me. Like they, they still haunt me. It's, it's just, anyways, no, the crickets don't exist anymore, guys. It's bees now. It's all about the bees. Our Patreon is now searchable. Just look up a nefarious nightmare and you'll find us. You'll get bonus content like our bonus podcast called Not So Nefarious Criminals, where we talk about Florida man or things that should be, well, Florida man. Yep. That's our palate cleanser pod. Oh, and see y'all next year for True Crime Podcast Festival 2023 in Austin, Texas. This year was a blast. Anyway, always remember, the bees are strong, resilient, and vulnerable. To us, Stacy Lanner is a bee. Christy Lanner is also a bee. She did what she felt was the right thing and today advocates for other bees. So, be vigilant for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Original intro music by Ghost Stories Incorporated. Remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional music provided by Epidemic Sound. This podcast was researched, scripted, and produced by Amanda Cronin and Courtney Finner. A Nefarious Nightmare is a Cloud 10 I Heart podcast. Managed by... A Nefarious Nightmare, Sim Sarna, and Jamie Rice of Murderish and Dirty Money Moves. Thank you again for listening, and be vigilant.